Hi, friends. Thanks for joining us online. We're so glad you're here. My name is Dave. If we haven't met before, I am the lead pastor here at North Point Church. I hope that something along the way, as we spend a little time together, will encourage your faith. Something supernatural will happen to you where you hear God's voice or encouraged or get something new. That'd be awesome. That's what my prayer is for you. And as we go through this today, uh, we are in our fourth message of our Elisha series. We are looking at the prophet Elijah from the Old Testament. A prophet is someone who God chose to speak to people on his behalf. And Elijah was one of them. And we recognize in the very beginning that Elijah was just an ordinary guy, not a big personality, not a great resume, but God chose him because he trusted God. His faith worked. That's what we've been talking about, is helping us learn how to have a faith that actually works. Not just that things we believe in, but actually taking that faith and making it work into our lives. Well, today we're going to talk about lost things. Not just lost, but you know, have you ever had your keys and you kind of misplace them and you have no idea where you put them? Or maybe you had your sunglasses on top of your head and you're thinking, I can't find them. Well, these are things, we're going to talk about something that was lost that you didn't intend to lose. And we're going to focus in on on our relationship with God, that somewhere along the way, life happens and you get really busy. And you remember before that you were really excited about God and you trusted God and you prayed and all those kind of things. And then somewhere along the way, it sort of just got lost. is isn't that you don't believe anymore, but you're not, you've lost your edge, if you will. We're going to talk about how to get that back. I'm so excited that you're here. We're going to look at a, a, an amazing uh, miracle, really kind of weird miracle at first, because what happens is that God makes an axe head float in the water, which is kind of weird. And if we're going to look at that, and we're going to actually see some really powerful truths that can help us, because God loves to help us find things that we didn't intend to to lose, especially in our relationship with him. So I hope you stay with us in just a minute. We'll come back, I'll come back and we'll look at that passage in, um, in second Kings. And, um, and we're gonna look at Elijah and that story. And I think it'll help you get your spiritual edge back. If that's where you're struggling, we'll see you in just a few minutes. I welcome everybody. Um, just real quick before we get into the message. Um, if we have not met before, my name is Alan Enfield. I'm the director for our online campus. And here at North Point Church, we are a church that is um, very much uh, based on relationships and friendships. And, you know, we're a true family together. And I just want everybody online to know that you are part of our family and you matter. You are just as big as part of this community as everybody here in person. And if you've been joining us online, we want to connect with you. We would love to get to know you. We would love to pray for you, to answer any questions, be able to serve you in any way possible. We would absolutely love to do that. And the easiest way to do that is to text the words, uh, hello to 763-317-0866. This kind of gives us a chance to be able to communicate with you and someone will reach out to you and we can begin our relationship there and it will be a lot of fun. We'd love to get to know you. And in just a minute, we'll be joining the message. If you love North Point, you want to get more plugged in, you want to take it up a notch, you want to make North Point your home, partnership is for you. It's super cool. We'll go over um, how to become a partner in North, North Point. You don't want to miss out on that. Um, so that is two Sundays. Um, so Sunday, August 21st from noon to 2 p.m. And then um, the 28th, so the following Sunday after that from noon to 2 p.m. then as well. Um, my favorite ministry that we have at North Point is our freedom sessions. Uh, so we have orientation to freedom coming up um, on Wednesday the 17th. So if you've heard us talking about freedom ministry and freedom sessions and the testimonies and the cool things that it's done for people in their lives and you want to find out more, orientation is for you. So the thing that's cool about orientation is there's no commitment. You don't have to sign up for anything, but you can come and listen and figure out what it's about. Here's some cool testimonies and something you don't want to miss out on. Um, so if you want to get connected with that, just text the word freedom to 763 317 0866, or you can come talk to me after the sermon as well. I can help you get signed up. Um, so another really cool thing we have going on is our Hope Speaks event. So I'm super excited about this. It is a new thing that North Point is hosting. Um, so if you're someone who's struggling with hurts, habits, hangups, and you're just looking for some hope, you want to hear some cool testimonies, you want to see what other people are doing, um, Hope Speaks is almost like a TED, TED Talk styled event where you'll hear different speakers talk about it. Um, you'll just get filled up with hope and cool things. It's something you really don't want to miss out on. Um, so doors open at 10.30 a.m. and that is Saturday, August 20th. If you want more information on that, uh, you can talk to Rob or Brandon. Um, it is a really cool thing. You don't want to miss out on that. Uh, so other than that, I'm just going to pray and we'll get started with the sermon. 
Uh, dear Lord, thank you so much for today. Uh, thank you for the just cool things that you're doing in our church right now, Lord. Um, I just ask that you come and speak to each and every one of us. You open our hearts and our minds, Lord, and you give Pastor Dave uh, the, the words that we can hear and the words that we need to hear um, just to bring us closer to you and closer together as a church family. Um, I just ask that you uh, just come and speak today, Lord. You bless our church, uh, that we all leave closer together and close to you, closer to you than when we got here this morning. Uh, so we pray for all these things and according to your will. Amen. Amen. Thanks. <clears throat> Morning, everybody. Um, if we haven't met, my name is David. I'm the lead pastor here at North Point. We're so glad that you're here. You know when we're getting closer to fall, when there's all kinds of announcements and things are kicking up. Um, things are getting starting to get busy around here. I love that. Um, I want to just highlight again what Rachel was saying about um, the Andersons. It's just uh, really cool. Um, some of you may not know the language. So uh, uh, Mike and Melissa uh, Anderson are what we call planting a church. They say, what's that? Is the, basically what it means is they're going to go into Plymouth, which is they've already gotten a home. That's what we're helping to move them in. And they're going to go through a process and they're just basically trying to start a new church. So that's, uh, they're coming in, uh, they'll, they'll eventually develop a, a core group like we did when we first started and uh, eventually launch into public services and all of that. Um, they are uh, looking for us and uh, to be their sort of home church. Uh, they've got uh, another church that's sending them, um, really nice big church, so they've got lots of good resources, but they need people locally to care on them and love on them and pray for them. That's our privilege to do that. And so they're moving, they got two moves, they're moving the first truck in on Monday, and then they're going back to Iowa, and they'll come in again on Thursday. So if you're able to help, um, they're looking for uh, people to just unload the truck with them on Monday at 1030, and then also on Thursday at 1030. And if you can help, I know it's kind of a hard time during the week, but a um, few people would be really helpful to that. Um, I've heard that if you come, Bobby will cook you lunch. So that's, there's a benefit there, okay? Um, let's just take a moment. I just want to add my prayers. Let's just pray for them as they begin coming into um, uh, Minnesota and uh, beginning this great adventure that they have. So Father, we just want to lift up Mike um, and Melissa Anderson to you, um, Lord, and their family. We ask that your hand would continue to be on them, that you give them protection as they travel from Iowa here and become uh, residents here in Minnesota and Plymouth. Uh, we just lift them up. We ask that you would continue to give them divine favor on the way, uh, that you provide for their needs, that you help us support them in any way that we're able to. And God, we just ask that this, this move would go smoothly because we know what moving like is not fun. And we just pray that you'd be in all of it as they begin to um, just do your work in the great adventure that you have for them here in Plymouth. So we lift them up in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, especially those of you guys who are also online, we're so glad that you're joining us. I, I know um, many of you don't watch necessarily at 10.15, you watch other times, that's the cool part about uh, watching things online, but if you're right now with us live, you're on uh, Facebook Live or you're on YouTube Live, would you just say hello in the chat box? We'd love to connect with you. Um, it's our way to just kind of say uh, hello and pray or question, all that kind of thing, and just uh, have fellowship there with everybody. We're glad that you're here. Um, this is uh, the fourth message in our Elijah series. I'm going to talk about that. Uh, this actually, we're going to wrap it up. We're going to start something new next week. But um, in saying that, oftentimes, um, as a pastor, I have an opportunity uh, and the privilege to help some marriages who are in trouble. Uh, I'm not talking about any specific one here, so just understand that. Um, uh, but it, it's, it's something that people have asked. And so um, when that happens, our very first meeting is almost always spent in me just kind of listening, you know, uh, trying to figure out what's going on. So I hear, you know, all kinds of things that are happening. And the fact that they're asking me usually means they're in deep trouble because I'm the last resort. Uh, you know, if we tried everything else, we might as well ask Pastor Dave kind of thing. Um, and so... Uh, as I listen to them and they start talking about the hurts and the, the resentment and, uh, and the anger and the disappointment and all of that thing that happens, I begin to wonder, I said, you know, I wonder what happened along the way. I, I mean, where there was at least one day, we know that on the marriage, right? There was at least one day on the wedding day where these two people were really excited about each other, where they really were in love with each other. They wanted to, it was so much so that they decided they're going to spend the rest of their lives together as husband and wife. And they had full of hope and all of that kind of thing. At one time, their relationship was really good, full of hope, full of love, and something's happened. 
So as we're sitting there in my office usually and I'm listening to, you know, the stories and it often has resentment and failure and hurt and anger and all those kind of things that happen along the way, I've often wondered as I'm hearing that and talk talk about their current relationship, I think, wonder where exactly from the wedding day to where we are now, what happened? Something happened, right? Right? It's important that you, to figure out what exactly happened so that we can at least fix it. If you don't know where it's broke, if you don't know where things got messed up, there's really not much you can do to have that change that situation. Now, as I've listened to these, rarely, almost never really, uh, is it a cause, this relationship problem in the marriage, is never really a cause by one bad decision by one of the spouses. It happens really rarely. What I found is that most of the time, the couples have no idea how the relationship went from where they were to being messed up. And as I listen to the story, and I can see from the outside, because when you're in it, it's really hard to see, but when you see it from the outside, begin to talk and ask questions, we could see some patterns that happened over a period of time to where they're at right now. And what's interesting about that is that many times the couple doesn't have a clue. They know something's wrong, something's messed up. They know the other person's not doing something that they want from them, but they don't know how they got there. Let me tell you another kind of scenario that that I want to talk about. This will come into the story that we're going to go. And uh, have you ever heard about how you boil a frog? Say, no, I don't blame you. Why would you do that? Um, But uh, if you wanted to boil a frog, you have two ways to do it. And it'll make sense in just a minute. So one of the ways that you can do is you can take the pot, bring it up to a boil, right? And you can take the frog and throw him in the water. And what will happen if the frog can do it? He will instantly, immediately jump out. Smart frog, right? Um, And and so he's like, no way. This is not an environment I want to be in. This is messed up. I'm out of here. Jumps out. Or... You can take a pot full of warm room temperature or room temperature water. You can place the frog in it and he'll have a great time. He's no problem. This is an environment he's okay in and he won't jump out. And then what you do is you turn up the heat. I've never done this. I've heard of it. Um, Just so, you know, I just don't want anybody coming back at me and telling me about this. Um, And you can turn up the heat one degree at a time and and let the frog get used to that. And then turn it up one degree and let them get used to it. And what I've been told is that basically because it goes slow enough and over time and the temperature just rises until suddenly it's boiling, the frog has no idea what happened to him. And then he dies. Our relationships with people and God can be like that. And what I hope to do today is put sort of a thermostat, if you will, a thermometer, however you want to call it, onto your life. I want you to just for the next 30 minutes, whatever we have left today, I just want you to take a few minutes and I want you to think about where you are, think about and pay attention to the temperature of your life in relationships, whether it be a relationship with God, that's a number one, or a relationship with other significant people. Where are you right now? And why would we want to do that? Because there's a good chance that for many of us who are followers of Jesus, who love him or not, we've been actually along the way somewhere, we've lost something in our relationship with God, in our relationship with others, and at this moment, we don't even realize it. Eventually, if we keep going that way, we're going to be like that couple that says, okay, I'm last ditch effort. But maybe we're sort of in between, and we don't even realize it right now. Perhaps you've lost some passion for God, or, so some of the, or you've lost passion for the things of God. You used to have it. Man, you were right on. You were fired up. But today, not so much. Some of you have lost some joy. There's been this deep-seated spiritual contentment and joy in your life. It was awesome. But somewhere along the way, you kind of lost it. And you're not really sure how. You're not even sure where it went. Some of you at one time had a great faith and you prayed and you expected God to do stuff. It wasn't just that you said prayers, but man, you were ready to go with God doing, thinking he's going to do big things and and you had a hope in him that you knew he was good as he says he is. And so you know he has plans and he's inviting you into what he's doing. But today, if we're honest, 
we're not really praying that much, you know? Maybe you're not even sure that if you really believe that God is listening or in fact that he's actually gonna do something. You had something important, but along the way, you lost it. Again, we've been in a series focusing on the faith of an Old Testament prophet named Elisha. And a prophet is someone who back in the Old Testament times would call and say, you're going to be my spokesperson, you're going, to, you're going to work for me and represent me to the world, and that's what Elisha was. And one of the things that we've noticed is, is that Elisha, when we started, we, we kind of compared him to Elijah, who was his, his mentor. Elijah was this big uh, personality, man. He was alive and, you know, huge and famous and all that. And, and Elisha was his apprentice, and he got apprenticed by that. But we realized that Elisha really wasn't that shiny. You know, he didn't have a great background in terms of all these, you know, mothers and fathers who served God and all that kind of thing. Um, he basically was just plowing fields, and God called him. And what makes Elijah is so important, I think, and helpful to us, is that while he was a normal person, he trusted God, and as a result, he did amazing, God was able to do amazing things for him. And so what we're after, what we've been after in this series, is not just faith, but a faith that works. Not just that we come to believe true things, that's important, it's a part of it, but it's more than that in the faith that God's called us. It's not just about knowing and believing true things, it's actually about taking that and our trust with God and putting it into work in our lives, to live it out every day. And Elisha helps us learn that. So in the last few messages, uh, let me just remind you, if you're around, if you're not, um, uh, I would encourage you to go to our website page, our website, I'll talk about that in a second, and you can look at these if you want to. Um, but in week number one, we talked about burning plows. And so we looked at Elisha and God called him and that burning plow means he was all in. He didn't know what was gonna happen. He, I'm sure he didn't feel like he was really qualified, but because God called me, he said, I'm all in, I'm burning my past and I'm ready to go, God. We learned that we need to burn some plows. The second week, we talked about digging ditches and we realized that God, we don't always have enough, but God can come and he can cause the rain. He can cause to come and, and have the things that we need, but we have to be ready for it. We have to have an expectation. We got to dig some ditches so that when God does come, we're ready to receive it. We learned that. That's part of uh, a faith that works. Um, last week, we, we talked about gathering jars. And remember, there was that widow who only had a little bit of oil, and she said, I don't have anything. But God uh, came along with Elisha and said, you do have something, and God's going to use it if you trust him with it. You need to get more jars. Be ready, because God's going to do something and multiply this. We learned all that. That's part of a um, of a, a, a faith that works. And if you missed any of those, go to our webpage, northpc.org, and you can go to the, mes uh, the message page, and you'll have links to our YouTube uh, videos on there. This one will be sometime this week if you, if you want to go back to this one. Now today, we're going to look at what perhaps is one of the oddest, uh, weirdest miracles pretty much all in the Bible. Uh, if you look through and survey all the different miracles that God performed through Elijah and his faith, uh, there are some really big ones, some really impressive ones. Uh, they're really, really cool. God used him one time uh, to come and, and, and heal a poisoned uh, uh, water uh, uh, lake or whatever it was. I'm not sure exactly how big it was, but um, this was the lake that people would drink water out of. That is what kept them alive. It got bad. It became poison, and God used him, and it healed the water, and people could live because they had water. God used him to raise a boy from the dead. That's pretty impressive. God used Elisha to provide a widow, like we talked last week, uh, who was about ready to lose their two sons, go into debtor's prison, and, and because of that, God provided and made that happen. God, through Elijah, healed Naaman. He was a commander who had leprosy, and that's a cool story. Now, in this miracle... Uh, we're going to look at, it's, um, the context is sort of like uh, you have Elisha, he's the guy, but then you have a bunch of seminary students, for the lack of a better term, maybe something we can relate to. It was uh, apprentices, uh, prophets who are an apprentice in Elijah, that's what's happening. They want to become uh, pastors, or in this case, they want to become a prophet, and, uh, and so they're learning, and they'll get together. Um, I'll explain kind of the, the context of it a little bit more, but in the process, they decided they were going to build something, and, um, and one of them started swinging the axe. It broke. This, metal, this iron uh, axe head fell into the, ground, into the water, into the Jordan River, and God made it float. 
So Elijah is a man, again, he takes that stick, he throws it, and it happens, and you think, wow, that's a really cool, really cool miracle. I mean, I've never seen iron float. I don't know about you, but I've never seen it, and God made it happen. That's cool, but so what? <laughs> you kind of look at it and think, uh, I'm not sure I understand the implications of this. I'm not sure how it certainly doesn't relate to me. What's the deal? Well, that's what I want to help you see. Um, let me give you a couple of things. Uh, and, and then we'll dive into the story. One thing that's very helpful to understand is that um, this iron uh, is very valuable in that time. It wasn't like you could go down to uh, um, Fleet Farm or whatever, uh, Home Depot, and buy yourself uh, another, another axe and go home and take care of it. These, these things were, were hard to come by, and, and they were very expensive. That's one thing. The apprentice prophet, who was probably pretty poor, I mean, he's a college student, right? I mean, he's living on student loans. He's probably eating ramen noodles. Anybody who's been a college student knows exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, it's cheap, and it gets you by. Um, it's just, just kind of, he doesn't have a lot of money, okay? So he comes, and Elisha says, hey, guys, we're going to go do this project. I'll explain that in a minute. And he borrows this axe head to do this job, and he loses it. And there's no way that he could possibly pay it back. That's where he's at. He owes this to the person that he borrowed it from, and he cannot get it back because he has no money. So in a way, I guess we could call this prophet a non-profit prophet. <laughs> it doesn't get any better than that, guys, okay? <laughs> I, I don't have any uh, Noel jokes, so that's just where we're at, okay? <clears throat> so this guy doesn't have much, he loses the axe head, and then he goes where he should go. He goes to the man of God. He goes to, you know, if you want to connect with God that back then, that's how you do it. You go to the prophet, and, um, and he says, we got a problem. I don't know what to do. And so God clearly shows Elijah, uh, and things happen. And I just want to point one thing out here. I don't know what you're going through, but no matter what you're going through, God cares. I mean, this really, if you look at it in the scheme of biblical history, it's not going to change anything in the world. You know, you're not taking on some big bad enemy. You know, people aren't suddenly falling and getting saved or anything like that. But this is a problem that one of God's children had, and God cares. If you have a headache, God cares. If you have a chemistry test or something like that coming up, God cares. If you can't find your sunglasses because they're on the top of your head, God laughs, but he cares, <clears throat> right? So let's draw the context. Again, Elisha was mentored by Elijah, and now at this point, that happened, we look at the other stories, right now what we have is Elisha now mentoring the next generation of young prophets. So he's now kind of turned into his boss in a way, or his, or his mentor. And so what we have is we have a bunch of young prophets starting to come to Elisha, and they're going, dude, you're the man. You know, Elisha, you're the guy, you're the man. I want to study with you. I believe God's called me to being a prophet. I need to figure out how to do that. You're the guy. Would you teach me? And he says, all right, come on, let's, let's do some stuff. And so Elijah builds what's called a school of prophets. And these people start coming. And many of them come to the point where I don't know what building they were meeting in, but the context says they outgrew it, whatever it was. So they needed more space. Now, perhaps I look at that and think in our situation, they couldn't multiply services, which is what we're going to do here in this fall. We're going to go to two services, so they, they couldn't just do that. They had to have more space. And so that's the context of what's happening, and let's jump in the story. So 2 Kings chapter 6, verses 1 through 7 says this. One day, the group of prophets came to Elisha and told him, as you can see, this place where we meet with you is too small. Let's go down to the Jordan River where there are plenty of logs. There we can build a new place for us to meet. All right, he told them, go ahead. Please come with us, someone suggested. And Elijah said, I will, he said. So he went with them. When they arrived at the Jordan, they began cutting down trees. As one of them was cutting a tree, his ax head fell into the river. He says, oh, sir, he cried. I was, that was a borrowed ax. 
And so Elijah, Elisha says, where did it fall? The man of God asked. When he showed him the place, Elisha cut a stick. I don't know what the deal is with a stick, but he likes to use it. Uh, Elisha cut a stick and threw it into the water at that spot, and the axe head floated to the surface. Grab it, Elisha said. And the man reached out and grabbed it. Weird, huh? It's kind of an interesting kind of, you know, what's the deal? What's going on here? Uh, interesting miracle. Uh, what do we do with this? One thing that is helpful to understand, uh, and everybody at that time hearing this story would have understand, is that um, uh, this axe head doesn't just, this is not just one of those moments that just suddenly unexpectedly happened. Um, back then, you would know that um, if you're going to cut trees down, you're going to have your axe, you got to do a couple of things. It's your responsibility as the axe, uh, the cutter, whatever you want to call them, uh, you have to make sure your tool's right. So you'd make sure that it's sharpened. That was one of the things that you would do before you started going at it. Another thing that you would do is you would make sure that the axe head was securely on the handle. Because why? Because this can happen. And everybody would know that. This is, not, this is something they wouldn't actually say because it's sort of like it's assumed. Everybody in that context would know that's what the, the cutter's responsibility is. So before you start swinging the axe, it was your responsibility to make sure, in this case, that it was fixed to the handle. And if it's not, you better solve that problem before you start swinging. So again, I just want to point out that this is not some just random, unexpected, we had no idea this could happen event. This happened because of neglect. You with me? I don't know what, maybe the, the young prophet was like, I want to get going, I'm not going to check anything, I didn't you know, sharpen it, I don't know, and off he went. But ultimately, he neglected his responsibility to make sure it was ready to go. So in the failure of this apprentice prophet, it was that he neglected his equipment and bad things happened. Now, there's another thing that I want you to embrace and I want you to see. I'm going to give it to you, and then we're going to come back to it a little bit later, uh, and we'll show you the story. We'll break it down. But here it is. This is in writing. Okay, here it comes. God knows how to help you find what you didn't mean to lose. I love that. God knows how to help you find what you didn't intend or mean to lose. Those of you who lost something in the spiritual, relational kind of realm of your life, I want you to know that our God, who we serve, is totally into restoration and renewal. He's into transformation. This is not a shame on you guilt message. That's not this at all. Our God knows how to help you find what you didn't mean to lose. So as we talk about losing this axe head, losing the edge, what I want to do is show you how this story can actually apply to us today. And I don't think any of you are going to, you know, uh, professional axe throwers or whatever, uh, but, it, but it relates to us. And so to get at this, I just want to ask you a really important question. And I want you to know that as I do this, this is a safe place. One of the things that we really work hard at is that we want to be a church where it's okay not to be okay. We don't have to put on masks. You don't have to try to be somebody you're not. It's okay to come in just as you are. Be yourself because we believe that's how God can really work and, how, and, and we love you anyway. So it's okay not to be okay, but we also want you to know you don't have to stay there. There is amazing healing power. There is amazing transforming power in God's church and in his faith. And so that is available to anyone who wants to receive it. So here's my question, and you don't have to say this out loud, please don't, but I want you to think it. How have you lost your spiritual relational edge? How have you lost your spiritual relational edge? Where are you? Maybe you're not at that point where it's just desperate and everything's falling apart. Maybe you're at the, I'm doing great, but most likely we're probably somewhere in the middle. Perhaps some of us will say, well, you know, I really haven't. I mean, things are going great for me, and that's awesome. I want to celebrate that with you. That's really cool. I thank God for you. Keep doing whatever you're doing to keep you there and to keep your spiritual passion high. Awesome. Now for the rest of us humans. 
you might honestly say that there was another time in your life when things were, were better, when, when your relationship with God is so much stronger, when your relationship maybe with your spouse or your children or your friends or church people, I don't know what it is, was better. So I want to ask you, how have you lost your spiritual relational edge? Some of you might recognize that there was a time when you did life with other committed Christians and it helped you and they encouraged you and you were able to minister to them and minister to you. They prayed for you, you prayed for them, they challenged you. That was good times. However, somewhere, and you're not even sure, along the way, things changed and now you look around and the only people in your circle of influence are maybe at best some nominal Christians. Nominal, what I mean by that, nominal just simply means in name only. And they're around. And so somehow you change sort of your circle of influence and your current friends aren't really pursuing God or maybe they're sort of pursuing God or they're not pursuing God at all. They're not living free. They're not loving people. They're not impacting the world. And as a result of you hanging around them for a while, they've influenced you and you've lost your edge. Maybe that's what's going on. Some of you, there's a time when you served in the church and you had that thrill of being used by God and being able to have somebody get blessed and, and find out about Jesus. You made a difference with your gifts and helping disconnected people find God and it was amazing. You had one, uh, what we call my one, and you had somebody and you were you're pouring your life into them and, and sometimes it was hard, but all the time it was fulfilling. And you got busy, you know, and somewhere along the line you stopped. You always intended to get back to serving, but you never did. So if you're missing something because you knew the thrill of being used by God, but now life is pretty much all about you, maybe that's where you lost your edge. Some of you, there might be a time when you had a passion for prayer. I mean, you'd get up early and you'd pray, and you had a prayer list, and you were praying for people, and you're praying for the mission and lifting that up, and, and uh, quite honestly, you don't even really pray over a meal unless someone's looking. Or you may pray about big things when the really big stuff happens, then you go to God. But the truth is, you haven't really prayed, you haven't really connected to God in any significant way for a long time. Maybe that's where you lost the edge. Perhaps some of summer you at the point in your life you really love to share your faith, you love the people who are far from God, man, you had a passion for them, you love to have a one, and somewhere happened along the way, you know, even though you, know, you haven't really, really haven't had a one for a while, uh, you haven't had any really concern for people who are far from God, somewhere along the line, it just fell off. You haven't had a good conversation about Jesus with anybody for a while. Some of you are really uh, honest with ourselves. We have to admit that maybe our standards have eroded a little. Years ago, you had, uh, I don't know, years, months, whatever it is, you had a, a Christian values, and you thought, hey, I am not going to do that. It's not because it was an all-out sin, but you know what? I don't want to do that because it doesn't please God. It's not good for me, and it really wrecks my witness to Jesus. So although I could probably indulge in that, whatever that is, I'm not doing it because, man, it matters. Now, I don't know. You know, something happened. Maybe you got one set of friends or a, a, a friend or two, and they keep playing it, you know, come on, come on, come on, let's do that thing that you really don't want to do. Come on, let's go do it. And eventually you kind of go, well, I don't know, maybe it's kind of gray, it's not really black, uh, it's probably okay to do once, and off you go. And before long, you start cutting corners, you're taking shortcuts, and now you're doing some things that probably you know you shouldn't be doing. Maybe that's where you're at. And in all of these, eventually, and I hope maybe even right now, as we ask the question, as the Holy Spirit's working in your heart and mind, which I believe he's doing, maybe you kind of look at it and say, you know what? I don't know how I got here. I have no idea what happened. I used to, but now I don't. What's going on? How have you lost your spiritual edge? You see, you can't, fix something if you don't know where the problem is. The reality is it can happen to any of us because all of us have a spiritual enemy whose sole mission, his sole desire is to kill, steal, and destroy everything that matters to God. And I don't know if you know this or not, but you as a person, wherever you are in your faith, matter to God the most. That's why Satan hates you. 
That's why he wants to destroy you. I can tell you it happens to me. Some people say that, that it must be, you know, um, so great, Pastor Dave, that, that you get to, you know, serve God all day and every day. And, and, and you know, I'm kind of jealous that you get to spend your, people actually pay me to do those kind of things. And I agree, it is a privilege. It is amazing. I'm so thankful for that. But I just want you to know, it's not as glamorous as it looks from the outside. <clears throat> and I've noticed that it's so easy to get caught up doing ministry, so focused on doing ministry, that I end up neglecting my personal walk with Jesus. I'm all about you know, doing ministry, getting stuff done, praying about that, studying so I can you know, bring something to you guys and all of that. But I'm pursuing the things of God, but I forgot that I should be pursuing him. There have been seasons where I am so thankful that God wakes me up to the neglect that I didn't even know I was doing and said, hey, you know, you and me, dude, don't forget, pursue me. Every year, um, I've been giving uh, the, the, the church year, I haven't really talked a lot about it openly, but I, I, I put a theme on it. And, and the theme that we have is one of the four things that we talk about that a disciple does. You know, pursue God, live free, love people, and impact our world. Last church year, we talked about living free. So I don't know if you noticed, but everything I could think of came at you about that topic, how to live free. It was awesome. I think it was really helpful. Hopefully it was helpful to you. This year... I just felt like God wanted us to put the pursuing God one. That, that this, everything we're going to, you know, we're going to talk about all kinds of things, but we want to really highlight pursuing God. How important is it? And so for me to get ready, I started reading books. I start, you know, listening to podcasts, all kinds of things in that category so that I can, you know, help and study scripture and all of that. And I have to tell you that I, I knew there was one book. I loved it. It's basically on this topic. And so I pulled it out. I said, I think I should start with this one. And before I got through the first chapter, God just kind of shakes me. And I realized as I said earlier, that I had been pursuing the things of God, which are good and important, not saying that isn't, but what I wasn't doing is pursuing him. And not pursuing him, it means you're doing everything in your own power. And um, for the last few months, that has wrecked me in a good way, and I want to bring that to you because it's so important. So perhaps the reason it's, you know, kind of quiet right now is that maybe you can relate to that. And, and this is not a guilt thing. This is just a temperature thing. You've become a full-time parent and a part-time follower of Jesus. Maybe you've become a full-time business person and a part-time follower of Jesus. You didn't mean to lose your edge. You didn't mean to kind of neglect God but you did. You didn't mean to stop praying with your spouse, but you did. You didn't mean to fall back into the old patterns that, that, that then lead you to then being addicted to things, but that's where you are right now and you find yourself there. You didn't mean to drift from the love and intimacy you had with God, and, and now you kind of wake up and maybe there's a little more depression there, you're empty, you're hollow on the inside, and you're not even sure how you got there, but that's where you are. You didn't mean to end up pursuing the emptiness of material things. But as you look back over your life, you're thinking, honestly, that's pretty much everything that I've been pursuing. Now I understand where I'm at. You didn't mean to become a part-time disciple, but it happens. And you lost your spiritual and relational edge. And for the most part, it happens because of neglect way more than this one decision that you decided to take a left turn or right turn or whatever. It happens uh, neglecting small things over time like that frog in that kettle and it begins to come up and then suddenly, finally, you realize it. So let me ask you, what do you do when you're swinging away and your edge falls off? What do you do to get it back? I want to look at this story from Elijah and um, this apprentice prophet. Let's look at it a little closer. And, and I, want, I, I see at least two things that I want to suggest to you that I hope will help in this area. So number one, the first thing that I see is that we um, need to be honest about where we lost it. To be honest about where we lost it. Why, where did that edge go? Because if you don't know where you lost it, you have no idea how to find it. 
Uh, in this, in verse six, you can look uh, in your Bibles later, but Elijah says, basically all this happens, right? And, and, and the ax head is in the, the Jordan River, think the Mississippi, big thing. And, um, and he's freaking out. And Elijah doesn't come and say, man, you screwed up. Why didn't you? You should have figured that's not what happened. Elijah just walks up to him and says, huh, where did it fall? It's a great question. That's what he asks. In other words, the ax head isn't gone, it's just where you left it. Where did it fall? Where did you lose it? That's what I'm asking you. Where did you lose it? Where did you start to lose that relational, spiritual edge? Here's what I know, you guys are all really smart people. And if you look back, you could probably say, you know what, I remember where I took that wrong turn. I remember when I stopped doing those things that I should do. I remember when I made these other friends that really are not good friends and they're dragging me in the wrong direction or I started dating the wrong person or you put the list in there. Maybe for you, you dropped the discipline. You used to pray, you had a time to pray and you got it done and now you just sort of let it go. You're not unsaved, but you lost your edge. You used to be devoted to actually pursuing God, maybe through reading the Bible and prayer and, and worshiping, but then you stopped. Maybe you've been a regular giver, maybe even a tither, and you sort of got behind, it happens, and so instead of, you just sort of stopped, and, and then you kind of wonder why that, that joy of worshiping God isn't there anymore, because you don't trust him like you used to. So you stopped. You might have been involved in a life group where others were speaking into your life and they were encouraging you and they were praying for you and they were calling you to, to account and those kind of things and it was awesome and it makes your life really, really full. It wasn't always easy, but it was meaningful and then you stopped. For some of us, perhaps you thought your secret, and you know what I mean, I don't, <laughs> but your secret, it wasn't gonna hurt anybody. It maybe hurts me a little but that's the only one that's involved. And then you look back and realize that this little secret, first of all, God knows, and it messes you up in your relationship with him, and then it messes you up, and then if we're really honest, it's messing up our relationships, and it's hurting you and hurting everybody you care about. Just gotta get real about it. Some of us maybe even got hurt by someone probably in the church. Sometimes even pastors, they do it. And you're thinking, you know, if they're going to act that way, forget them all. You know, I, I can't stand that. It's hypocrisy. I don't want it. And your heart begins to grow hard. And really sadly, what happens is Satan loves to make us think this. He loves to trick us into this. Not only do you start blaming God's people, but now you start blaming God because he allowed one of his people to do that to me. To be honest about where you lost it. If I want to be gut level honest, you know what happens to me as a pastor is there was one time that really messed me up and it's been a couple of years, but um, it's just such a significant thing for me. I was at that time um, really more concerned about how I looked in ministry than I was in making God smile. I cared more about how I appeared in the district level and my past, other pastor friends. Um, I, 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 I cared about how, you know, I came off to them, you know. And I realized that God just cut me, cut me short and was like, hey. And I realized this is, the, this is where I came up with that phrase. You've heard me say it. Go after God's smile. Because that's when God said, you really want that or do you want me? Man, forget that. Those guys are, pastors are messed up people. You don't want that. So um, I want God's smile. That's where that came from. I want to go after God's smile. I don't know where it is for you. So one, you got to figure out where you lost it. Number two, and this is cool. This is important. Number two, with God's help, take back what you lost. With God's help, take back what you lost. Our God specializes in helping you find what you didn't intend to lose. We can see this in verses six and seven of, of 2 Kings here. When he, when he showed him the place where the ax head fell into the river, again, think Mississippi, this is deep and big and, and massive. And so Elijah, again, uh, doesn't come along and say, 
Why did you do that? What's your, you know, it, doesn't, it doesn't hassle them. It's like, you should have. You shame on you. You should have been faithful. You didn't do it in your acts, you know, pre-act stuff. That, it doesn't say that. He's aware to fall. He says, all right, let's go to God about this. And so he cuts a stick. He throws it in there. And iron floats. Now, that's pretty cool. But if you miss the next thing, you'll miss the main point. Because then he says to the apprentice prophet, now you lift it out. See, God is not going to do for you what you're responsible to do for yourself. God will not do, God, God will, the, the other way we say this is, is there are two parts to faith. There's a part that God must do, the part that you can't do for yourself, yourself, but the second part is there's a part that you must do that God won't do for you. God is not going to make that apprentice pick up that axe and put it back on the handle. That was the apprentice's responsibility. The man reached out his hand and he took it. With God's help, lift it out. With God's help, take it back. With God's help, take back what you lost. Starting to do the things that you know you were, you were doing before you lost the fire, before you lost the edge, and start doing them and trusting God. A couple of weeks ago, we talked about um, only God can send the water, but sometimes he wants you to dig a ditch. And it was, it was God saying, I'm about to bless you, but you got to dig some ditches so that you can, you can um, contain what I'm about to give you. You got to be ready. This is an expectation. When you dig the ditch, there's an expectation there. Last week, we, we talked about uh, uh, God multiplying the oil. There's no way that the widow or even Elisha could multiply the oil. Only God could do that. But what does he tell him? Go get some jars because you're going you're gonna to get as much as you can fill up jars. It's up to you. Get some jars. God can make the axe head float, but you have to pick it up. You have to lift it out. He wants you to take back what you lost. He wants to grab, he, he, will, he will cause it to come into your reach, but you gotta grab it. Now I wanna caution you at this point. I, I, it's just out of experience. Maybe you can identify this, maybe you can't. But we have an enemy that loves to lie to us and put thoughts into our minds. So oftentimes when, when I'm pursuing God finally and, and, and I think God's gonna do this and, and he's gonna help me and, and so I'm ready to, to pick it up, that God's kind of talking to me in that and saying, here it is, this is where you lost, this, let's go deal with this, uh, come to me, all that kind of thing. Almost simultaneously, there's another voice. And it says something like this. No, you can't get it back. You've gone too far. You've done too much. You are too messed up. There's no way that you can have that back. After all that you've done, you've lost the best of what you could have had. It's over for you and all those kind of things. Anybody can relate to that? Here's what I want you to know. With God, it's never too late to become the person that he wants and could have been. It's never too late. As long as you're breathing, it's never too late. It's never too late to get back what you thought you could never have again. It's not too late to have what you need to ha and, and, and more of it because God is the power behind it. You haven't gone too far. You haven't done too much because our God specializes and helping you find what you didn't mean to lose. So what does God want us to do? What's going to happen here is he's going he's to bring that, whatever that thing is, he's going to bring it within your reach. He's not going to do all the work for you. But he will do what he can do that you can't do. But then you have to do something. With, your faith has to work. And so you have to grab it. You have to lift it out. You have to take it back. You have to go after it. I don't know exactly what that means. Maybe you have a broken relationship. And God's going to bring it up. And he's going to say, now, it's time to forgive that person. Let him go. And let's restore the relationship. I don't know what it's going to be. Maybe you say, you know, I haven't connected with you, God, at all. So what are you going to do? You're going to spend some time praying. You're going to pick up your Bible. You're going to start reading. You're going to get into worship because that's the part that you can do. And when you do that, God will meet you as you do it. 
One more thing. Ready? Here's the one more little statement. Here's how we do this. You do what you can do, and then trust God to do what you cannot do. This is so good. I hope that you got to listen to this. What we do is we don't sit around and say, okay, God, I screwed up. Uh, go ahead and fix everything. That's not how this works because we already know some stuff. The Bible tells us we need to repent. The Bible tells us to change direction. The Bible says stop doing some stuff. Start doing some stuff. We need to do what we can do and then trust God to do what we cannot do. Can you make an ax head float? I can't. Not a chance. You can't do that. Only God can do that. However, when God does it, you can lift it out. You can grab it. You can take it back. Yes, that is something you can do. Can you create in your own spirit more spiritual passion and faith? You really can't. God has to do that. You need God's help with that. You need God's voice with that. You need to hear his voice and, and, and begin to, when you do that, to respond to what he says. The Bible says that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So you can put yourself in a place where you hear God's word. You can put yourself in circles where they're talking about God and, and trying to pursue God. And as you're around that, God's going to lift you up and then he's going to say, you want me? Are you going to pursue me? Grab me and let's go. So you're going to start praying and you're going to start reading and all those kind of things. You can choose to worship even when you don't feel like it. You can choose to share your faith with other people even when you don't have all the answers. You don't need them. You can pursue God again. And when you pursue him, God promises that you'll find you, that you'll find him. Guys, you can come up. So I want to, I, I love this promise. This is where I want to kind of close this morning. Then we're going to pray a little bit. And, and it's from Jeremiah 29, 12 through 13. I love this. I want you to notice that, that this is a promise to those who are willing to pursue him. Here's what it says. This is God speaking. Jeremiah 29 from the Old Testament, 12 to 13. It says, then you will call upon me, God's talking, and come and pray to me and I will hear you. You will seek me, and now that word seek, we talked about this, I like the word pursue better, it means the same thing, but I just like it better, so we're going to praise that, okay? So, you will pursue me and find me, and when you pursue me with all your heart, basically what he's saying is, when you pursue me with all your heart, I will make sure you find me. How cool is that? And it's not like we have to do this much. A lot of times it's just do it a little bit, you know, just have that heart that says, all right, God, I am willing to face wherever it is that I lost my edge. And God, I'm going to pursue you about it. And God comes in and just says, all right, I'm with you. I'm in on this. I love you. You do what you can do and trust God to do what you can't do. I'm going to pray. And I just want you to kind of listen a little bit. Father, we just thank you for who you are. And uh, Lord, I know that you said we're two or more gathered. You're in our midst. Holy Spirit, we welcome you. And right now, those are listening online at right now and those are in, in this room, I ask God that you would work in our minds right now and bring something to our attention. Where is it that we are losing our edge, God? What relationship, what discipline, what attitude, what actions? We give you permission right now to just lay your hand upon our shoulders and show it to us. Just bring it to our minds. And Lord, as you do, we pay attention to it. And whatever it is, we're gonna do our part, whether we need to ask for forgiveness, whether we need to forgive somebody else, whether we need to start doing something, whether we need to stop doing something, Lord, we, we want you. We cannot live without you. We love the things that you do for us, but God, we want your smile. And so wherever you can't smile on us right now, Holy Spirit, work among us. Speak to us. And as he does, my friends, respond. We're gonna spend a little bit of time here in worship. We encourage you to do that. If you wanna stand, if you wanna sit down, that's up to you. But keep in that mind because the Holy Spirit's gonna to talk to you if he hasn't already. So Holy Spirit, come.
Hey, thanks for hanging in there all the way to the end. I hope you found something that was helpful to you. Remember that sometimes it's easy for life to just kind of buffet us and mess with us, and you kind of lose your edge. But God wants you to have it. How do you find your edge? You start where you lost it. You got to figure out how you lost it. And then you begin with what you have. And God can do amazing things. I hope this has been helpful to you. If there's any way that we can serve you, pray for you, we would love to do that. One of the ways that we can do that for you and get kind of connected with you is you can text the word hello to 763-317-0866. It'll bring up a form, ask you a few questions about your email address and your name, and we would love to interact with you and find a way to serve you and, and a way we can pray for you. We want you to know that you really are part of our church. You're part of our, if you're online and, and you've just kind of connected with us, you're family, and uh, we love to be family, and so we just want you to be a part of that, and we consider you that. We love you. Hope you have a great week. Next week, we'll start a whole new series. You won't want to miss it. I'll see you next week. God bless. Have a great week.